Hi, everybody. Welcome to the conservation panel. Uh, for an hour, you get to hear about some really, really cool work being done by a number of people in interesting organizations. Um, so the ground rules are everybody has seven minutes to talk. Um, I have a little timer here. Uh, and then two minutes of, um, of Q&A. Well, actually two and a half, sort of three minutes of Q&A. So um, if you're a speaker, I'll be sitting right there. I'll flag for you when your time is getting short, uh, three minutes and uh, one minute. Um, and then manage the Q&A, and then we'll move to the next speaker. So um, with that, I want to welcome Stephen Brumby from National Geographic Society. And you have a clicker right there as well. OK. Hey, this is a fairly small room, so I may walk away from the microphone. I'm Steve Brumby. I'm the, I lead geographic visualization at National Geographic Society. That's the nonprofit science uh, exploration and conservation science organization um, that has the magazine and uh, television channels and all the digital products and plush toys and everything else is uh, is in a separate organization called National Geographic Partners um, that it spun out of of Natio Society. So um, what I'm talking about today is a new thing that we're developing at National Geographic. Um, we developed it over the course of the last year, and uh, we announced it in June. Um, and uh, there's a Google Earth Engine component to it, which is why Tanya and folks were nice enough to invite us out to say a little bit about it. Um, so the Earth Pulse Initiative is, a, is this um, new, new thing we've put together. The key point of it... Okay. All right. I am, I am going to be nailed to the microphone. Um, Earth Pulse is a system that enables data-driven conservation um, for, and it's intended for, senior decision makers. And I'll go through the implications of that as we go. So the opportunity. Billions of dollars are spent every year on conservation. Billions of dollars have been spent every year for many years now. But the state of the world conservation protected areas and, and unprotected areas is clearly not done so well. Uh, one, of the, one of the reasons we believe this has happened is that while all this money has been spent, there aren't really good systems for measuring the impact of investment. How do you really measure the investment of what you're putting in? How do you prioritize future areas for investment? If you can, prior, if you can measure and prioritize those things, hopefully there will be, you can do two things. You can do better spending of the money you have, and if you have good data-driven quantitative conservation, you can attract additional money to conservation that currently ends up in philanthropy for medicine or something else. Um, Earth Pulse is designed to solve this challenge by providing a decision support system specifically for senior decision makers. So this room, this event, we're the experts, right? If you're, if you're at this thing, you're an expert. Doesn't matter how junior you might feel you are, you're in the expert category. Um, the people we're talking about are folks who don't know what GIS stands for um, and is, you know, are, are people who are not technical. So how do you help them get the very important answers to the key questions that they have? How do you make it easy enough for anybody to use? Um, now, I, I like to say what Earth Pulse is not. Earth Pulse is not a system for tactical operations. So if you're a ranger doing anti-poaching operations, that's great. There's other systems out there that you should use if you want to do that, not us. Um, if you're doing day-to-day -day management, repair, maintenance, stuff like that, that's also not us. We do the longer-term strategic reporting and proving the impact of investments. And we're going to do that by bringing together the best science, um, visualizations, algorithms, and, and automation, it's because we want to provide this as a service for every protected area. OK. So one way to think about the, the audience for this system is, is what we call this a persona. It's a made-up person that's sort of doing what we imagine is the person who's using Earth Files. So Corinne, the careful decision maker, you can imagine her. She's a senior program, man, a senior program officer at a major NGO. She might be a government minister somewhere. She's got a number of protected areas that she's involved looking after, she's responsible for. She doesn't really get the chance to go visit them in the field, but she has to make key decisions. And the, the quote is, it would be great to really know where we could and should focus our work as well as funding in the future. OK, 
Okay, so here's a here's, I'm going to walk through an example for how we help Corrine. Um, so here's a protected area, Ellen Penetrable in Argentina. This is a real protected area, and what we've made, what EarthPulse provides for El Impenetrable and for all the world's protected areas is a dashboard that's continually updated. And there's two things about this dashboard that I want to make sure that, that I convey. One is that there are many platforms out there that provide data layers. That's great. That's state of the art. We're trying to go one step beyond that to not just provide the data layer, but to provide what we call a widget. It's a widget on the right-hand side so that, for example, Corrine wants to know how much carbon is in her protected area. Now, normally, the way we'd help her is we say, you know, go download it from Resource Watch or something and then get a GIS expert to cut out the shape and do the calculation, blah, blah, blah. Why? We can automate that. A lot of the GIS requests for protected areas are run-of-the-mill GIS requests. They can be automated and done in software, executed, for example, on Google Earth Engine with software pipelines. There's no reason to require people to have local capacity to do these things. People are still going to need local capability, GIS expertise to do certain things, but let's have them work on the stuff that they need to work on and not the everyday stuff. So we can just say there's 6.1 tons of uh, million tons of carbon. There's, you know, this is a fully protected area. We can show them the land cover. We can show them the deforestation that's accumulating, drawing in data sets from different services like Global Forest Watch. Um, we can back out and show the whole country of Argentina where this protected area is associated and uh, is located. And we can show how much of the whole country is protected. In this case, Argentina is about 10% protected. And we can also show using a data set that National Geographic Commission that about half the country of Argentina is currently, is currently still reasonably low impact and is therefore a candidate for future protection. We can back out to the continent level and show how um, you know, how, how, you know we, how the, her protected area fits into the mosaic of all protection and all the opportunities for future protection. And that can even roll up to a global number that provides a dashboard for the planet. And because it's being continuously driven with, up to, with software that's, that's, that's um, you know, being calculated for every protected area in every country, it all just rolls up continuously to a high level number. And we can do this not just for human jurisdictions, but also things like range extent. So here's an IUCN range extent for a particular subspecies of giraffe that inhabits Uganda and, uh, and Rwanda. Um, actually, sorry, Uganda and Kenya. And we can imagine generating biodiversity and, and habitat alerts for this specific species. And imagine now every species in the world has its own dashboard that's automatically updated because it's hard to teach giraffes to use GIS. But, they, but the people who look at, care about giraffes might want to know these things. So um, because we're National Geographic, we also want to build in storytelling. To, to enable people to understand not just the numbers, which have not been always available, but also the emotional reason why you should care about the numbers, which I think is one of the big underrated things in remote sensing science and machine learning, that even after you've got the right numbers, you still need to find a way to connect to your audience so that people care about what you're suggesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tanya didn't think I'd dismount that. <laughs> We do have three minutes of Q&A time, so if anybody has any questions about Earth Pulse. Thank you. This looks like a really interesting tool. I was wondering if you could speak to in the development how you decided on which land cover types to use, um, how granular to go, and how to back it up so it's globally consistent. And along with that, if there is a historic baseline or you're starting now and moving just forward. Mm. Uh, okay. Great question. So. A key thing that's needed in conservation is the idea of the baseline and the and the time series. Okay, it's not enough to just produce a static shot. People do paper reports that are one time only, and they're not as in, not as important as stuff that's continually updated. Um, by using automation and actually using machine learning to um, to generate data between reference years. We're hoping to really turn all of these um, data sets into continuously updated, automated data sets that can also be extended back through time with the data that's available, for example, on Google Earth Engine, where you have Landsat <laughs> data back to the 70s and other data like ABHRR back to the 80s. Uh, so the, the question was if you're going to do, try and do any projections of that as well. Yes. <laughs> I can imagine that this would just reinforce more funding to the protected areas that are already receiving sufficient funding, and that's why they're performing well. Uh, do you anticipate how to kind of even the playing field? Uh -huh. Great. So 
just like in the Bay Area VC world, we don't just want to be a late stage fund that invests in successful PAs. We want to allow two things. One, we want to demonstrate the biodiversity and habitat value of new PAs that are being set up. The National Geographic is working, for example, with a, with a protected area called Penjari, which is a brand new park in West Africa that hasn't been developed much yet. And so for that new park, we're able to use satellite imagery to cheaply and quickly provide a baseline, an initial baseline of what's there, which can be used in future work and provide a bunch of tools that at the moment only the largest, most well-funded PAs can provide for themselves, we can do that now with this sort of remote sensing approach. And by offering those different, by revealing these types of opportunities from seed funding to late stage, we hope to you know, attract investors who are interested in different stages. And I'm deliberately using Bay Area language. Before I was at Nat Geo, I'm actually the technical founder of a VC-backed startup. So. Thank you. Um, thank you. That's super, super interesting. Maybe expanding a little more on the modeling, future modeling you're planning to do. Um, are you planning to also help inform decisions on like trade offs between two different investments in conservation, for example, or like targeting most effective for, I don't know, biodiversity ecosystem services targets? Like if, if an investor is like, okay, I want to improve this metric, but what are the trade-offs and the benefits um, between investment? So like scenarios, analyzes kind of thinking. Yeah, sorry, that's not super clear. No, that's, that's a great question. And the answer is yes. Um, the, the two things. One, um, we want to be able to forecast under different scenarios of, uh, for example, climate change scenarios or um, other SDG type scenarios. Um, you know, sustainable development or not so sustainable development scenarios. We also want to provide that ability to analyze portfolios of protected areas so that you can understand and, and, and also in terms of sharing information between, porf between protected areas, reveal what um, investments are actually impactful and, uh, you know, and hopefully under what circumstances so that you can try and promote data-driven knowledge across the PA community and improve the understanding that, yeah, this park is like this other park and it needs these sorts of investments to bring it up to the next level, whereas this other park is sort of different. And, but now we've got a data basis for that rather than just anecdote or network. Can I ask a mini follow-up question? Um, when you say uh, be able to like see the trade-offs and uh, data driven, what are the metrics that define like what how are decided what are the metrics that define what is impactful? Right. So uh, so for that we're um, working with UN development programs, UN environmental programs to try and bring and cons uh, the um, Convention on Biodiversity to biological diversity to bring in the internationally defined metrics that are used for things like the Aichi targets, right? And so as much as possible, we're trying to not reinvent, not try and invent our own metrics and data layers, but, but bring all of that together in a way that makes it, actually makes it transparent and, and helpful. Thank you. And I, I, I'm here today and, and, and all tomorrow, so please come and find us. And Tanya can help introduce. Okay, yeah, um, as it says there, I'm Andy Arnell, and I work at WCMC, which is the World Conservation Monitoring Center in Cambridge. I'm a senior GIS officer, and I don't work directly with the protected areas team, um, or in the protected areas team, but I do work with them. So I'm gonna attempt to be your expert, but I'm not really. <laughs> but what I am here for is to get a lot of feedback about protected areas data and how it's been used and how we can do a better job. So if you take nothing else from this talk, that's what I'd like to gain. Uh, out of this, so please do talk to me afterwards or email me. Good. So the big problem you're probably all familiar with uh, is <laughs> horrible graphs. One is uh, the coverage of protected areas has go been going up, uh, but biodiversity is still in decline. I don't need to say too much more about that, apart from one of the things uh, that is wrong is that uh, protected areas are not in the most effectively placed uh, positions at the moment among other problems. And to help with that is uh, we've got conservation planning, which you're all probably familiar with as well. There are various ways of doing this. Um, systematic conservation planning being one of the key tools at the national level. Um, and 
it revolves around a, a set of questions. Where is biodiversity? What state is it in? And then where you can, then you can think about prioritization. Where to act first to um, manage and protect uh, in order to conserve the biodiversity. To do this, you can go quite a long way with just a, a, a few data sets. And South Africa is a prime example of this. You've got a um, map of ecosystem types, so what was originally there before we came in and trashed it, um, what, uh, how much we've trashed it in the ecological condition. And you've got down the bottom, you've got biodiversity targets for ecosystem types, which is things you can derive from various studies, so how much you would like to um, have protected. And then, of course, in red, which is what I'm going to talk about a bit more, is a map of protected areas. And out of these data sets, the protected areas layer is actually surprisingly hard to get um, into, a, into a format that's usable and to get hold of in the first place. At the national level, it can be hard enough. At the global level, it's really hard. Um, so I'm just building up to make us some really important uh, WCMC. We've been working on this, luckily, for a long time, as you're all probably aware. And we have um, this, the World Database on Protected Areas, um, which, as we mentioned a fair few times at the conferences, uh, the Google Earth Engine conferences, and now Geo for Good. Uh, it's a lovely picture. Um, probably easier to see it in this in terms of actual coverage, though. So how much is actually cover covered of the ocean? Uh, we've got 7.7% uh, as of uh, the stats that we've got uh, the, la the last month. And we've got 15% of the land covered. And these are getting relatively close to the IHE target, um, which may or may not make sense, uh, depending on uh, your viewpoint. Um, but they are getting relatively close. But as we said, it's not necessarily changing the picture. So uh, this is where we still need to do a lot more thinking in terms of national planning, but also in global planning. Um, and once again, luckily, the WDPA is around to help with some of the global picture. And in this case, it's now in Google Earth Engine. It's been there for a while. And I'm hopefully people are aware of this and started to use it. Um, and one example was uh, uh, obviously over there, Stephen Brumby. Uh, already, I'm not trying to interrupt you for talking, but you were. No. <laughs> Um, the work you're doing with, <laughs> I, that's fine, it's just, just sorry, it's fine, that's fine. Um, no, uh, the work you're doing, for example, and then the work that Carly has been doing with the glo new Global New Deal for Nature, um, using it, it's fantastic that it's there. Um, but as well as doing those global analyses, you can do simple ones. So um, this is an example here, just saying... You can do simple uh, gap analyses with, your, with certain data sets, which is something I just did earlier with some work we were doing from, for Global Forest Watch, where we've got uh, biodiversity significance, which is basically uh, hotspots of endemism based upon range size rarity, or rarity weighted richness, as I prefer to call it. And in red, these are the areas of forest that are popping up with areas of high endemism. Um, and it, just a simple analysis, uh, a simple overlay can with the World Database Protected Areas. In this case, I've made it into an image, so it's easier to mask, um, uh, to put over. You can see that these hotspots pop up in red of unprotected areas now. Um, and this is quite powerful, even for some of the work we're doing with COCO, um, helping people work in the COCO zone and looking at areas of high risk. You can see already that um, two things. One, if I can go back, is that in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, you see the forest areas, uh, if anyone knows West Africa, will probably be quite familiar with this, uh, disappear uh, when the protection's on. So as in everything outside of protected areas is gone in terms of forest, where there was a lot of forest. Um, but also the protected areas are doing something, which is positive. The other one is that uh, in uh, of the two chunky bits left in the cocoa zone, where the area in Cameroon is popping up quite uh, prominently with of a lot of species, small range species that are at risk if uh, COCO does go there. So it could be a new frontier um, for, for looking at um, ways to limit possible confrontation with the, I don't know if that's the right term, but confrontation with COCO in future. Um, and that was a relatively simple analysis. And as you say, it can scale up. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do really is focus on uh, asking you some questions. So we've got these data sets. It's the author this data set, it's the authoritative data set uh, globally for protected areas. But for analysis, it's big, it's complex, uh, it's, there's a lot of do, do's and don'ts, 
and um, <coughs> we've got some guidance, but is it enough? So there's the WDPA manual, which some of you may have browsed, may have looked at heavily. Um, is that enough with the community tutorials for Earth Engine help? So that's one of the things I've been thinking about doing. Would that help? And if so, what kind of use cases would we have? And lastly, uh, would a modified analysis-ready version be useful? I'm not promising this, but it's something we're still thinking about, if, if there's ways to do that that would make sense. And I think that's it from me. And if there's anything that I don't cover, please email me. Uh, thank you, very nice. Um, and we work with WCMC a lot. You saw the WCMC WDPA data on the previous talk. Um, please define analysis ready on that last line. Uh, so <laughs> that's a fair point. Um, I think I'd like everyone else to define what they need for their analysis would be an easy way of putting it back. But um, in terms of analysis ready, it depends on what you're doing. But if you're looking at coverage, you've already got the problem that there's massive overlap between protected areas, which is on purpose because they have they're, they're put in place for different reasons. So there'll be many designations overlapping. Some na someone could naively do something where they add up all the areas of protection and say that's the coverage. So there's things like flattening the, the layer. Um, would that be useful? Are some areas too, uh, there are too many vertices in some areas for some protected areas? I mean, this is the data we get from the country, so we can't necessarily change it. But we might have to think of ways around it to help. And, and how easily available is it as a time series? Okay. So, um, as a time series, it's not easily available as a time series. Um, and there's various reasons for that, one of which could be around uh, increasing problems with restriction of some of the data. So, they're bringing some, some countries are bringing restrictions on their data, um, which means that then we'd have to go through and find out everything in the, in the past as well. Um, also, there's some issues with how time series is done. So I've got a colleague who's done a paper on time series. Um, but one of the simplest ways, and in, in generally recommends don't do time series unless you really need to, but you can look at the uh, designation year. And it's got problems with doing that, but it's almost as many problems with doing it with actually getting each data set in the past. Um, but I can give you more information uh, in an email or something like that, or discuss after. Um, it's relatively complex, but uh, it would make sense when you when you discuss it a bit more. Trying to link a thank you, uh, link a. Um, that sounds better. Uh, essentially, what's the minimum mapping unit and how precise you can be. So that's another really important piece here. The final piece is, uh, at least in the U.S., we've done a lot of work with the U.S. PAD. The, and, and so, yes, there are a lot of overlapping polygons. That's absolutely a problem. People add things up twice, major problems. Um, and then there are many slivers uh, in overlaps. And you start to go into fragmentation analysis, and you see you know, giant stripes running through countries. Um, so uh, we've done a lot of analyses and work around to fix those problems for certain analyses. So absolutely, those are valuable. Well, that's good to hear. Thanks for that. I'm, I'm trying to log these in my head. <laughs> is there any is there time for one more? Is that uh, we are out of time for me. questions. Thank you, Andy. Thank you <laughs> okay, next up is Dave Thal from Worldwide Fund for Nature. Hi everyone. Yeah, I'm Dave Thal. I sit on the global science team of WWF and I'm the data and technology person on that team. Uh, WWF is a big organization. Um, we are operating in over 100 countries, and we do all kinds of stuff. I'm going to tell you about some of those things uh, kind of from the ground to the cloud. Um, and I'm happy to take questions about any of them. Uh, yeah. OK. So one thing we do is we do a lot of uh, mobile data collection. Um, there's a long-running study on the impact, the social impact of uh, marine protected areas on the people who live around it. Um, we were using a tool called Aquo, but recently started experimenting with uh, Kobo Toolbox, um, which is built on top of ODK. Uh, and people are finding it uh, very, very easy to use, and I have some feedback for people who also want to use it. So mobile data collection. Um, 
We're partners in Wildlife Insights, which is a camera trap aggregation platform uh, that a lot of partners are um, using to pool their uh, camera trap data. So the idea is you'll be able to use Wildlife Insights to manage your camera trap data um, and, make, and make the data public so people can do global analyses across all the data that are uploaded to it. Um, it's uh, going into sort of beta launch in a couple of weeks, um, and then it'll iterate a few times before it's public, um, broadly public. But initially, it's got about 2 million camera trap images. And one of the nicest things is it has machine learning in the back as part of it. We're working with Google on that. Um, so the imagery that's being uploaded in uh, is being built into machine learning so that species can be recognized. Um, so you can uh, not only recognize species, but also use the system to filter out blank images, which is like the bane of many camera trap type people. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, Another application is uh, Mapathons with Earth Engine. Um, so this is a group who worked with uh, government officials in Myanmar. Um, they brought all these uh, folks together who worked on infrastructure. It was a five-day workshop. None of them knew anything about Earth Engine to begin with. Um, they started with a little training on Earth Engine. And then they all sat down and started mapping out their territories that they knew about in Myanmar. And they were roads experts, people working on rail. Um, they used uh, machine learning um, in Earth Engine to do uh, land cover uh, analysis. Um, they, you know, they, they used the, the classifiers, to random forest classifier, to make some land cover. And then they assigned costs to various things in there, what's forest, what's road, what's rail. And then they used cumulative cost mapping to figure out where the choke points were going to be. Um, and so this is an example of one of the things they come up with. So this is cool. This is this is government officials who actually are doing urban planning and uh, land use planning, who haven't used Earth Engine before, using it to do connectivity modeling. Very happy about that. Um, so Aurelie Shapiro works in WWF Germany, and she does a lot of awesome remote sensing. Um, she, I'll talk about two things. One is fragmentation work in Lao, and one is um, sea, uh, seascape mapping, especially of um, uh, seagrass. Um, so this is a, an Earth Engine app that they built to do fragmentation uh, mapping with Earth Engine. So I can tell you about how they did it. Um, but they delivered this map. And you can do, choose any two years. This is, I think, 2001 and 2018. And the darker areas are intact forest. And you, know, you can see the key down here. Um, you can see from 2001, it looked like that. 2018, it looked like that. Um, so this is, this is a good way to view fragmentation, and it's a kind of a, a novel application of Earth Engine. I'm, I don't know how many other folks who are doing that. Um, with the seascape mapping, the thing that's cool about this is, uh, so they did sort of you know, normal remote sensing classification to find seagrass um, in Mozambique. This is off of Mozambique. And then wrote up an Esri story map about it. So who, who uses Esri story maps? Is this like, yeah, OK. So Esri story maps are pretty cool. And what they did was you know, they got the story map talking about the thing. And you scan down, and there's an Earth Engine app embedded in the story map. <laughs> so cool. And if you go down, there's this little uh, um, button down there that says Start Exploring. And if you hit Start Exploring, it's a functional app. Like you can go in, and you can click the labels, and you can zoom in and out. Um, so you know, Esri and Google are working together in a story map. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, so yeah, this is it. You can zoom in, it's great. OK, so the last thing I want to talk about is uh, something I'm working on a lot now, which is trying to organize the data that we're using, um, both to figure out how we're using the data and also to figure out um, what data we need to get and how best to use it. So I'm going to put, so this is pretty, this is like new and we're just working on it now. Um, and I hope to get a lot of feedback about this. And possible answers are, well, that's really cool. That's been done before, or that's totally stupid. And I'm ready to hear any of them, or probably maybe all of them. All right, so the idea is to um, have a way of systematizing data around sort of landscapes. And um, there are three axes, so it's kind of a cube. One axis is tenure, very coarse. So is the land state owned? Is it um, governed by uh, local communities, or is it privately held? This axis is um, what kind of 
land cover type is it? So when we're looking at forest, is it intact? Is it managed? Has it been converted? And then the other axis is uh, different kinds of data. Is it ecological data, economic data, governance or societal data? And this makes a cube, a three by three by four cube. And at each point, you can say, we've got these data, these models, um, you know, these applications. We can apply these responses to get uh, the change we want and really systematize how we're uh, both storing the data that we have, going out and getting new data, and applying the data. And the idea is that this would apply to multiple landscapes and multiple land cover types. Um, so it's kind of an idea just to get a grip on uh, how we can best use the data that we have. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, so. Al. Um, we have time for a couple questions. Hi, some really cool work there. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your your data management and workflows. I'd be interested in hearing from this whole community about this because we're using all sorts of different tools. Um, you know, you you mentioned Esri technology, R, different utilities, and now we have some data in the cloud. We have some data local, um, and I just like to hear a little bit about your approaches to that. So it's uh, organic. Um, <laughs> this, this, so this is one of the things I'm doing is trying to make it more, more systematic. Um, WWF is a uh, kind of federated organization. And there are national offices, each of which has domain over the work that they're doing. And so there's a lot of independent work. But it's, it's organized um, through these sort of global coordination teams. Um, so a lot of the data that traditionally has been held has been sort of in, in ArcGIS. So there are Arc servers that store a lot of the data. Um, for the camera trap imagery, one of the cool things about Wildlife Insights is we're actually using it to court to bring together all this data, and we're going to use Wildlife Insights to monitor to actually do that management. Um, so it's it's we're now going sort of data type by data type and trying to coordinate a little bit more. And mostly, what's been happening has been just the data and analysis people in each of the org each of the offices just talking to each other. Yeah. So that kind of ad hoc is the way it is now, but we're changing it. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Thank you, Thal. Okay, I'd like like to introduce uh, Brady Allred next. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, I'm going to narrow this down in scope a lot from where we just were. I'm going to narrow it down in terms of geography, in terms of biome, and in terms of the actual specific question that we're asking, and also in terms of the conservation actions. Um, I work with a fantastic team of science advisors to the United States Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources, Conservation Service. Their job at the 30,000 foot level is to make sure this never happens again. I like to start with this because I have taught classes where students do not know what the Dust Bowl is. The Natural Resources Conservation Service, it's the old Soil Conservation Service. They were formed out of the Dust Bowl nearly 100 years ago. An act of Congress in this country declared that our soil our natural resources are important, and we're going to do everything we can to conserve them and to make sure this doesn't happen again. Now, that's at the 30,000-foot level. What happens with the day-to-day -day operations? The NRCS, they don't own any land. They don't manage any land. They work with private landowners to do a better job conserving their resources on their own land. In nearly every county in this country, there is an NRCS office where you can go and get technical assistance about how to conserve your land. Whether you're a rancher, whether you're a farmer, or even if you want information on how to grow vegetables in your backyard, they will tell you how to do that. They also have an instrument called the Farm Bill in this country, and they can provide financial assistance, usually through cost share programs, to help you improve and to do conservation practices on your lands. So it's that working lands conservation. And as Aldo Leopold said, that's what we have to do if we ultimately want to win this game. Now, I'm a rangeland ecologist, so I focus on rangelands, grazing lands, grasslands, savannas, flyover land, wasteland, whatever you want to call it. That, that, that's what I focus on. 
Rangelands make up a big chunk of this country, a very big chunk. How do we monitor and assess our conservation efforts across this nation, particularly on rangelands? That's the problem I was tasked uh, and my team was tasked to solve. Now, if you Google rangeland monitoring, this is what comes up. These are the images that come up. People looking down on the ground at their boots, right? It, the range people, they, they are known for knowing their plants, identifying their plants, running plots and transects. They do a really good job of that. But because of that, they don't know what's happening on the hill right over there or the other watershed or the next county over, the next state over, right? There's a lack of, of spatial, spatial knowledge, even spatial context. And we spent our whole lives measuring plots on the ground. But when you do that, you're just doing inventories. And when you do inventories, you measure a very small portion of the landscape, even if you measure it through time. This is just a simple example of, I don't know, 10 plots through time in an area. You're measuring less than 1% of that landscape. But if you can do monitoring and do it through time, you can cover that entire landscape. So this is, uh, how do you do that? How do you make this scale? Remote sensing is the answer, right? That's, that's why we're all here. This idea isn't new. This is a paper published in 1976. That was before I was born, okay? Uh, a remote rangeland analysis system. People have been talking about this for a long time. People have actually done it, right? This map that I showed is actually the NLCD where they map categorical land cover. It's good, it's an advancement, but it's not exactly what we need. Categories don't tell us exactly what we need in terms of rangeland monitoring and in terms of rangeland conservation. Um, and it's only produced every, every so years. So I was tasked with the idea of improving that. And what we did is we took 40, nearly 40,000 on the ground vegetation plots. These are plots that are measured consistently, the same protocol for the last 15 years. Um, in different locations. One of the biggest rangeland vegetation data sets out there, probably the big, biggest rangeland vegetation data set. Uh, Use Earth Engine, and what we were able to do is we were able to produce maps like these, maps of functional groups that are not categorical, that are continuous, that go from zero to 100%, that span big geographies, that go back in time, and that provide that medium resolution. We all know the, what Landsat resolution is, but when I talk to the stakeholders, when I talk to the agency folks, I tell them it's, a, it's more or less the size of a baseball diamond. And that really gets them thinking. They say, we have information on all the baseball diamonds across the United States of America. What can we do with that? So we're changing the way they think. If you were in Chris Brown's machine learning session, he talks about what's the best way to evaluate um, the accuracies of these models. Well, you have metrics, you have all the quantitative analyses, and we did all that. But the best way is when it matches up with real world data. And this is just an example, photographs um, of uh, specific plots in those years, and our graphs correspond, our results correspond with those, with those photographs and with those results. What, in this particular case, what happened between those uh, years is a grazing management strategy was changed, and we can see the results right there. As discussed in other talks, we can quantify the outcomes of our conservation out, uh, actions. We can see, are they really working? If so, great. If not, what do we need to do differently to change them at a local level, a regional level, and a national level? Lastly, this data is of no use if it's just sitting in our offices, on our computers. So we collaborated uh, with Jeremy Maljek here. We built a web application to deliver this data to the people that need it. It's accessible to landowners, to agency folks, to NGOs, whoever needs it. They can get online, visualize it, download it, do custom analyses right there, there then on the fly, get the information they need to make their conservation decisions. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you. Great talk. Um, with different hats, I've worked with USDA for many years. Um, so this is great. This data's out. How how can other countries learn from this to start to look at rangeland to to better characterize rangeland and to characterize uh, and, and and just to to introduce inst institute monitoring and then mapping for rangelands in other countries, particularly say. 
um, Southern Africa and Australia say? Yeah, I mean, there, there's lots of approaches. I don't think there's there's one answer. Um, I think the the lessons learned here, if anything, is what we like to call co-production. And we need to build data sets and work directly with the stakeholders to make sure we are building something in aligned with what they're doing and with what they need. I think many times as scientists, activists, whatever hat we're wearing, we build things that people, that we think they need. Um, but we need to sit down and listen and work with them directly and build stuff that they, they really need and that they could benefit from. The framework for doing that is, is diverse and I think changes from place to place. Is there a lot of innovation in international collaboration with some new techniques like carbon farming or response to climate change? That Because I, I just have this idea in my head that rangeland management is very static and it's very historic. And I don't know what kind of new innovations you guys are utilizing, but I'd be curious because you seem like the... You seem like the right person to ask. Well, uh, I don't know about that. I, I think I think there is an innovation happening, and um, technology is is definitely helping. I work with this this team where we we advise this agency on all sorts of things, from from conservation strategies to building targeting tools to building data sets to doing uh, outcome evaluations. I think people are willing to listen now. And I think people are willing to move on in the rangeland discipline and say, okay, what we've known for a long time is still true. We need to move on and do a better job of conserving and managing what we have. What are some new ideas? It's been received very well uh, in my work. Uh, hi, uh, it's very impressive. And from a rangeland lab from UC Berkeley, uh, one thing that we've always concerning right now is really about fences on rangeland and then one biggest challenge is there's really no data on fences um so i'm just wondering whether it's one of the concern of this platform or if not do you have any plan to get uh, a very systematic fence layers starting from the u.s and hopefully for the world sure um the short answer is no and and the reason for that is um we, sitting in my office in Montana, I don't know what's happening on the land. I don't know have that local knowledge. I don't have that local history. I, I don't know what changes have been made or are planned to be, been made or, or did, weren't made. And our, our approach has been to build data sets and build tools that can empower those local decision makers. So when someone sits down and is planning on making a change, they can look up the information they need from this data set as well as other data sets that we produce, produced or data that they have themselves, and they can integrate that into their workflow. They know what has happened. They know in 1999 they changed that grazing management strategy, or in 2012 was the worst drought on record in the country. And they can say, does this correspond, and how do I need to, how do I need to change my actions accordingly? So as opposed to dictating things uh, you know, from afar, we're just trying to empower the, the, the local knowledge and the local users. Awesome. Thank you, Brady. Excellent. Uh, next, I want to welcome up Amanda Armstrong from University of Virginia. Is the clicker right there? Hi. Um, thank you all very much for having me this afternoon. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit again, um, and this is a, quite a mouthful of a title. Um, uh, so this is a, a project that is um, kind of in its infancy, it's, it's in the first year, and um, so my hope is in talking to you about a little bit um, sort of the science angle of it, um, that we can sort of together think about the applicability of it um, sort of at the broader scale, because at, at some point we'd like to be able to apply this globally, um, and we do have plans to build um, an app. So. There are um, a number of people on this project, um, and for the sake of time, I won't go into them, but I'm happy to talk to anybody about it afterwards. Um, so the idea of this the foundation is, is that you know, hierarchy or biodiversity hierarchy um, can be assessed along three di dimensions. Um, those you know, chiefly are composition, structure, and function. 
Um, however, biodiversity conservation is largely focused at the species level and sometimes at the community level. So our approach provides information on ecosystems based on how they're functioning. Um, so through the use of NDVI metrics, we can focus on function as it relates to primary productivity and carbon cycling. Um, our goals are to develop maps of ecosystem functional diversity uh, for the circumpolar Arctic um, tundra and highlight areas of functional hotspots and functional rarity in addition to examining functionality and functional diversity over time. So our users um, for this project are um, really any, any organizations that are interested in, in biodiversity monitoring um, and conservation, especially for this particular part, part of the project in the Arctic. Um, and um, our funders are, are the GeoBond Working Group, um, as well as Circumpolar Arctic Flora and Fauna and Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program, as well as the Terrestrial Working Group. So this is not a completely new idea. So one of the, the collaborators on this project um, published a paper in 2013 um, where they developed this, this concept over the um, Brazilian Amazon and or um, more than that. Um, but some of the things to kind of take into account are that this, these, this map is denoting areas of functional um, similarity as opposed to species similarity. Um, and it's, it's agnostic to vegetation composition or structure completely. Um, and there's you know, a, a bit of timeliness re with regard to um, studying this in the Arctic um, because um, for now, the Arctic is still a relatively remote area. Although with the reduction of sea ice and potential for more energy exploration, that may change. Um, so this is a prime time for identifying functionality or functionally diverse areas throughout the Arctic um, so that they may be targeted for conservation. And of course, there are many more other basic science reasons for doing this in the Arctic. So this is our methodological framework. And today, I'm just going to focus a little bit on what we've been doing um, in the beginning. Um, and the first question that we, we asked in our approach is, is what attributes of the seasonal NDVI curve represent the most um, important modes of variability in the data set? So to do this, we investigated um, key um, ecosystem functional attributes, um, which are different characteristics of that NDVI curve using PCA analysis, of course, in Google Earth Engine, um, using MODIS 16-day composite NDVI data. Um, so these are those three different, uh, three different attributes. Um, so we did a whole bunch of different statistical analyses to try to connect um, different um, concepts around that seasonal NDVI curve. And, and what we found were that um, the three, the three um, factors that seem to control uh, uh, variability the most were mean, mean NDVI, um, greening um, NDVI, so that's the date of the maximum slope um, during the green up, and then senescing, so the date of the maximum negative slope, um, which is like die off. Um, so, and just to give you kind of a, a working definition, the um, EFTs in general are patches of land surface with similar di di dynamics of matter and or energy exchange between biota and the physical environment. So after we derived these um, NDVI, or sorry, these um, EFTs, we can begin to sort of uh, map them over time and use different mechanisms to bin them to create our, our functional types. So um, for the mean NDVI, we, um, we divided them into five different groups. Um, green up, we divided into three different groups. And again, with senescence, we divided them into three different groups. So essentially what that creates is a possibility of being one of 45 um, functional types. And so this is what that looks like when you map it over the circumpolar Arctic tundra. Um, and as you can see, there's um, a whole bunch of different variability across the landscape. And we can't just use, say, latitude to define um, how we see that, that variability and or species. So the first thing that we can do with this is, is um, using the, the new roster version of the circumpolar Arctic vegetation map, or CAVM, um, we can identify the functional diversity within the vegetation types. So CAVM divides, um, divides the Arctic tundra up into these different um, vegetation zones. Um, and we can also identify different vegetation type, types that may be functionally functioning similarly. So the, um, on the right map is actually the same map that I just showed you, but um, because we can't, uh, we don't have the top view in Google Earth, we had to export it. So we're hoping that maybe that will happen at some point. There's some talks about that. So I just had to put a little plug in there. Um, so if we look at these different CAVM subzones, you know, what we want to see is that there would be uh, 
some diversity within these subzones, because if there isn't, then we're not doing a very good job of describing this functional diversity. So we're happy with what we have been able to um, get so far. So if you look at these different subzones, you can see that there are actually high levels of diversity within them. Um, so that's doing pretty well. And so the next thing that we're um, seeking to do is, is um, another collaborator on this project did a study um, of the um, uh, the Baja California Peninsula, um, looking at taking these EFTs now and looking at the um, using them to calculate EFT richness as well as rarity, and then use that and overlay it with protected areas to see where um, where we're missing some um, biodiversity from that standpoint. Um, another um, aspect of our project is um, to sort of break it up and to look at smaller areas. So here's the Yamal Peninsula in Western Siberia. So we're looking at um, basically uh, the interaction between oil and gas development um, at, along with also, also territories of the nomadic herders, the reindeer herders that are in that area. So right now there's kind of an overlap of where these di two different entities are, are trying to look. So, um, you know, if you if you overlay this with our EFT map, it's kind of hard to see. But um, what you can see is that two of the larger areas overlap with these two activities, um, and they're both in areas of high productivity and, and EFT diversity. So um, one of our current areas of investigation is to look at how reindeer herding affects EFT diversity over time and to understand, um, generally try to understand ecological re resilience in this region. Um, oops. So that's, I guess I'm pretty much out of time. but. Okay, so these are our next steps, and um, one of the things that I'm working on is looking at drivers of change. Um, so the GIF, which I got to build after one of the workshops yesterday, <laughs> um, is right there. That's the mall. Um, so these are EFTs through time. Thank cool. you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Actually, like we know, the Russian area, it's very difficult to get the ground truth data. And also, Russian government, of course, they don't want to provide the you know, actual data set. So it's very, like, you know, the useful to, you know, the capture, monitor the, the uh, Tundra area. But I have a question, like, uh, the, the, how do you approach from, from here? Like, how do you approach this vegetation map? Like, do you want to quantify the global warming effect around this area? Or how do you, you know, which direction are you going to right now after this, you know, vegetation map? So I, th I think I heard most of your question. Um, how, how do we approach, I'm yeah, sorry? How do, you, how do you apply this, like, you know, the vegetation map to, uh, to quantify the, like a global global warming effect, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, or, you know, how do you use this data set for kind of you know for the future application? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Okay. So, um, definitely one of the areas is to look at um, change, and because this is um, you know developed using NDVI, and you know we can look at we can think about um, change in NDVI, and we can try to also um, directly relate it with envir environmental variables. Which yes, so global, so warming could be one one trend that we could try to look at through time. So we have the entire MODIS record, um, and we can and we can um, do some statistical analyses. I'm actually that's kind of my arm of the project is looking at and trying to look at environmental drivers and then effects as well. So yeah, great. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks to all of our speakers, to Thal and to Brady and Andy and Amanda.